Okay. All right. So as I was saying, um, this is a general outline of uh, what we'll be doing now. A brief story of uh, knowledge representation on the web. Uh, we'll go through early history with philosophers. We'll go through everything that was done in the 20th century and then uh, how the web had a drastic impact in the history of, uh, of knowledge representation. Up to the current date where, you know, we're now dealing with things like big data, uh, the four Vs and, uh, and future challenges. So before we get into that, what is knowledge representation? Uh, you, may, you may be asking yourselves, uh, if you go to the Wikipedia page, you'll find plenty of stuff. It's a field of AI. Um, it's about representing information about the world in a form that a computer system can use to solve complex tasks. It's about incorporating findings from logic to automate various kinds of reasoning. It's about formalisms guided by how humans solve problems and represent knowledge. So this sounds half interesting, half ambiguous in general. Uh -huh. What does it mean exactly? So I think a great way of jumping right into knowledge representation is uh, to go through this ancient um, writing, a ghost. Of things said without any combination, each signifies either substance or quantity or qualification or a relative or where or when or being in a position or having or doing or being affected. To give a rough idea, examples of sub substance are man, horse, of quantity, four foot, five foot, of qualification, white, grammatical, and so on and so forth. So you have a bunch of examples of, um, of all things said without any combination. So this seems like an ontological model of the world, right? A classification of all ideas and everything possible in the real world. Uh, who do you think, actually, um, I'm taking your bets, who do you think wrote this down? It's this man. My favorite guy. No takers? <laughs> Nobody, <laughs> hey, there we go, yes, <laughs> correct. So Aristotle was, um, you might have suspected uh, wrote that. And categorizing the world is one of the big questions of knowledge representation. And this is one of the oldest records we have of, uh, of trying to do it. Um, so the history of philosophy is full of other figures that try to concretize or go deeper into the classification of all things. Um, Brentano went into the classification of what Aristotle called accidents, so what we might know now as the property, the properties of things or attributes of things. Uh, Porphyry of Tyre did the same with what we now call, what Aristotle called substance, so entities, so to speak. And then that dealt with the classification of the world. So Ramon Llull, a Catalan philosopher of the 13th century, uh, proposed something different, proposed a mechanism, what we would call today a mechanism for reasoning. So how to use that categorization of the world to, in order to automate inferencing, to automate reasoning, right? And this was, of course, very rudimentary, a system of disks that combined symbols to explain uh, things and theories about God. Actually, I think was made to convince uh, Muslims that you know that Catholicism was the right thing to do something uh, silly of the period but you get the gist of it so by just moving the wheels of this mechanism you could combine different symbols and make different arguments this is an idea of automated reason all right and then we do a big leap until the 17th and 18th century when ideas like dualism that separated you know uh, the body and the mind uh, ideas about empiricism in Britain uh, provoked, you know, a massive increase in the knowledge that uh, humans had about 
uh, about how the world works, uh, but also in engineering. So the creation of what we could call precursors of computational artifacts. So can we make machines that can process symbols that describe a categorization of the world and ways in which these symbols can be combined in order to produce reasoning, so new uh, symbols of the world. All products of the scientific revolution of, uh, of uh, this time. And this immediately uh, led to mechanical calculation, right? So uh, the uh, invention of modern mathematics in the sense that you could think of algorithmic manipulation of numbers where the meaning of those numbers is not important, right? So um, what's important is the symbols, the operators, and all those things. And all things were used in mathematics, but are, are also very important for knowledge representation because it, knowledge representation also operates on, on the same basis. So symbols and operations between these symbols. Um, further on that, and perhaps this is like the important slide of philosophers, um, you'll get, so you get things also happening in Britain with John Wilkins, so um, things like real characters, so the substitution of human language, uh, he spoke of Latin because Latin was the human language of his, of, of his time, but uh, of substituting a common language, so to say, with a more formal language that, uh, formally describe the entity, those categories and entities of the world and their properties. Um, he based this system uh, on numbers. So it was kind of uh, uh, similar to the metric system. But I think uh, Leibniz gave the best um, product of philosophy when it comes to thinking of the abstract world, thinking of models of the world, abstract models of the world and formal uh, models of the world with his Characteristica Universalis. So the idea uh, was that, uh, you know, we humans, we would have a new kind of tool, uh, you know, a tool more important than microscopes or telescopes, and that tool uh, would be this Characteristica Universalis. So this formal language to describe ideas and the operations that uh, uh, are allowed between these ideas to produce new ideas. And then, you know, all the process, the entire process of thought would be just a calculation, so to say. Um, so that's, let's say, that's the basic prospect of, of what knowledge representation is. So what is calculating with knowledge? Um, it's about uh, inferencing, right? So an algorithmic manipulation of, of of a symbolic representation of this knowledge. Um, but most importantly, where the meaning of words is not needed, right? So we only care about, in this um, syllogism, for example, we don't care what things represented by A are, right? So we know that the rule of the syllogism is true, irrespective of the concept represented by A, B, and C. Those could be any concepts. Um, so abstraction is a fundamental aspect as well of uh, knowledge representation. Uh, and we can perhaps attribute that to uh, Thomas Hobbes, who's the father of political philosophy, but also wrote uh, a lot about, uh, about abstraction. Uh, there you go, a, you know, a particular instantiation of, uh, of this syllogism. All right, then we jump uh, quickly to computers, because that's also the reason why, why we are all here. Um, ideas about the development of logic, of formal languages, of calculus, and also of algorithms. So you all know the figure of Alan Turing, the proposition of uh, the Turing machine, also the Turing tests for, for intelligence. Uh, to von Neumann, we owe the process of memory architecture, and also the birth of AI in the 50s with uh, automatic theory improving. So how do all these things relate to, uh, to knowledge presentation? Well, in knowledge presentation, we deal with models of the world, right? 
and we know that intelligent entities and this belongs to regional discussion of uh, of uh, of the ai uh, dark stool seminar um we'll know that intelligent beings have these models of the world these adequate models of the world uh, that they use to answer questions that they use to perform tasks that they use uh they use to um uh, to perform physical abilities so these models of the world are important for intelligence and they are at the core of knowledge representation so they're about knowledge representation is about the correct representation of these models of the world and also the reasoning that we can do with those models of the world um, uh, following established uh, certain rules all right so something important to take here into account is that these representations and the reason that can be done with these representations have a certain complexity right as we will see in the course um, not as you would have seen in the KR course of, uh, of the master. That's the purpose of that course, to go into this complexity. Um, but we'll see a little bit of it uh, during this course. But the, the takeaway message here is that some of these reasoning tasks are very inefficient. Uh, they cannot be done uh, in a more efficient manner. Uh, so we need to choose very carefully which ones of them we allow in our noise representation language so that the language itself will be able to you know to compute and to finish in a reasonable time uh, when we ask it to uh, to reason so an important part of uh, kr was done in the 50s with uh, propositional logic and, and sat so uh, the statistability problem um we don't have time to go deeper into what sat is uh but you know sat is a relatively simple problem in propositional logic you can write formulas like the ones you see here right so only binary uh variables you you know I, each of these variables can only be uh true or false and then the satisfiability problem is finding a right combination of assignments to these variables what we call a uh, uh, satisfy what we call an assignment so that the formula uh, when we compute the formula the formula will be true right and we call that a satisfying assignment so if a, if a propositional formula has a satisfying assignment then the formula is satisfiable and if it has not then it's unsatisfiable so in this example you can see here that if we set uh, A, uh, B, and C uh, to true, or to one for the matter, then the formula is true, which means that the formula is satisfiable because there is at least one satisfying assignment. Now, if we change the last clause, and instead of saying no C or B, we say uh, no C or no A, then the formula is not satisfiable. So this means that if we try every possible assignment to the variables, we will never find one that makes the formula true. So the formula is always false. And if we want to do that, well, there are obviously two to the power of n assignments for n variables, and this is very expensive. So there is nothing else we can do uh, to find out whether the formula is not satisfiable other than going through all the possible combinations, so all the possible assignments, and checking them. And in the end, if none of them are make the formula true, then the formula is not satisfiable. So this is an important problem because this was the first problem to be known to be NP-complete. So this means that there is no efficient uh, deterministic way of uh, telling if any formula um, is um, is satisfiable and many other np complete problems reduced to uh reduced to sat so that's why we know they are also uh np complete problems so a lot of research in knowledge representation in the 50s had to do with you know representing the entire knowledge of the world as propositional logic formulas and seeing if uh if they were more or less um uh, satisfiable then in the 70s things changed so we had a little bit more of, uh, of expressive uh, logics 
um, we had uh, ways of um, of describing rules and facts, and basically that gave birth to expert systems. So we could feel systems that had essentially a, a knowledge base, so a large list of rules, things of the liking of if fever and coughing, then uh, flu or <laughs> cor coronavirus. Coronavirus, exactly. That was uh, the, that was. If it, I mean, that's because it was the uh, the the eighties. Because if it was now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, exactly. So that was the knowledge base, this long list of rules. Then we had a fact base. So you can think of that as an initial variable state, like, you know, Albert has fever, for example. And then an inference in engine. So something that would take the facts and they, it would put the facts into the knowledge base and then, you know, operate the rules until the rules generate new facts uh, that are relevant for a certain task. So the obvious problem, this worked very well in some fields, like in medical diagnosis. The obvious problem with that is managing this large number of rules, because as soon as you want to make an expert system good in anything, then you have lists of thousands and thousands of rules, and that becomes unmanageable. So this gave birth to um, to knowledge organization and knowledge engineering, which is very important. Then on the uh, question, uh, I got a question. You said SAT is MP complete and shown case with two SAT, isn't two SAT polynomial? Yes, true, that's very true. I, that crossed my mind while I was uh, on that slide and to not spend more time on SAT, I didn't say that, but yes, this is true. Two SAT is polynomial time solvable and, uh, and uh, only above that things get NP complete. So it's a problem that quickly gets NP complete, but the simple version of it is, uh, is, uh, is polynomial. Uh, uh, thanks, Marcin. Um, right, then on the 80s and 90s, we had this huge leap into frames and semantic networks. So the idea is not so much um, the the description of uh, you know finding the right logic to encode all this uh, content of the real world, but to actually model the world, right? So to uh, write down things in in these so-called semantic networks, right? So things like mammal has vertebra, and mammal is an animal, and fish is an animal, and stuff like that. And then for every each of these concepts, you would have frames that could describe their uh, basic attributes and the values of these attributes. So a lot was done in semantic networks and a lot of what we'll, see, we'll be seeing in the course is sort of inherited from the tradition of, uh, of frames and, and semantic networks. At the same time, in the 90s, uh, 80s and 90s, we saw uh, a lot of research done in logics that would enable the encoding of rules and formalisms summarizing uh you know making out machine computable uh expressions of these semantic networks and description logics was the most successful of them so with description logics you can uh you can design ontologies you can make you can define concepts and properties of those concepts and define them in such a way that um a reasoning engine can uh, operate on uh, on on, the, on that knowledge. So uh, this is the basis of uh, OWL, the web ontology language that we'll be using in uh, in the course. And as I said before, certain choices that you make in this uh, in these description logics, uh, so in the specific description logic that you choose for your formalism, have a strong impact in. Um, in the complexity of reasoning, so if you want uh, if you want your for, your ontology to be able to say things about uh, role transitivity, then that's going to have a price, right? And some of these things are cheap, and some of these things are expensive. Uh, so the University of Manchester has worked out a very very cool web application where you can just go and you know tick around the things that you want in your description logic and it will tell you how complex it is to uh, solve, you know, concept, concepts disability or uh, or a box consistency or all of these tasks. 
so, um, so uh, any questions? Any more questions so far? Uh, checking the hands up menu and the chat. Okay. So, um, so what is knowledge representation? What is an ontology in the context of everything we just said? It is a surrogate. Um, so it is a model, an abstraction of reality, a representation of the world. It's also a set of ontological commitments, you know, the things that can be described by, by the language and the things that are described in the knowledge base. It is a fragmentary theory of intelligent reasoning, right? So it has operators that uh, do things on the symbols and create new symbols, and that has a complexity. It is a pragmatic efficient, it's a medium for computation, right? And it's also a medium of human expression. Like as humans, we, could, we can read those formulas and uh, we can understand them and we can write them. So KR is also about trade-offs, trade-offs. So it's about correctness and complexity. It's about optimizing tasks and reusing existing ontologies and modules. It's about the scale and the speed of inference. It's about expressiveness versus computational complexity, what we just said about uh, the representation language that you need to express certain things of the world and at the same time keeping things uh, manageable for the computer. And it's about understandability of inc and expressiveness. So this human component, right? That we humans understand these logical formulas and we can process them. So this was a very fast introduction to the history of KR. Uh, and you might be asking yourselves, well, that's fine, but this is a KR on the web course. What is the role of the web in, uh, in all this. And actually, it turns out the web has a huge role in this because, uh, well, I don't need to, you know, every year we had to change this slide and we're not doing it anymore. What happens in an internet minute? Yes, every year, you know, there's a gazillion um, terabytes being generated by all these pl massive platforms. I uh, think it's missing Zoom now. Right. <laughs> and WhatsApp. <laughs> Exactly. And Netflix. Oh, well, Netflix is here, but I think, you know, what, probably. No, you know, it must have changed in, in scale. In exactly. <laughs> so we don't need to convince you about um, the amount of data the web uh, uh, has. And, you know, the massive amount of, uh, of, of data that we're storing in all the hard disks uh, that are in interconnected in the world. The, the big question to, set, to ask here is, well, is the web and the knowledge that we find in the web essentially playing the role of a big knowledge base? Is the web one of these, you know, gigantic, ginormous expert systems of the 70s? Or is the web, isn't the web just, you know, a big set of uh, propositional, maybe not just propositional formulas, but, you know, some logical formulas that we can just compute and use uh, in a way can be seen as you know the big knowledge base of humanity that we could use to trigger massive inferencing about everything we know every idea ever written and um, you know can we let machines to operate on all that knowledge uh, for our own benefit um, so that's the big question that knowledge representation on the web uh, is uh, is trying to address and is trying to answer. So that's on a very general level, right? So in a very specific level, this translates into everything we find on the web that is that comes in the form of data, right? Not so much in the form of human knowledge because we don't know exactly how to make machines understand human knowledge, although I think we've gone a long way in the last years. Um, but this is a very basic problem, you know, the Facebook has my ID and knows everything about me as a person and of my social network and places I've been, parties I've gone, all that sort of stuff. 
I'm also a number in the LinkedIn database. I'm also there on the web. LinkedIn knows everything about me as a worker and my jobs and my colleagues and my publications. But somehow this is disconnected from each other, right? So me as a person on the web, as in this big knowledge base, I'm sort of repeated in different databases. And these databases have different schemas. Essentially, I'm two different persons, one in Facebook and the other one in LinkedIn. And you know, this holds for all of you, uh, all of us. Um, so it's very hard to get this global vision of singular entities when uh, data is so uh, uh, is contained in silos and uh, and uh, clustered in uh, in individual data banks. So here comes the vision for a web of data. Right, we have data on the web, lots of data, but it's not a web of data. And um, does any of you know who the man in this picture is? I do. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, exactly. <laughs> there you go. The inventor of the web. It's getting better. I mean, like I was in a, um, a, a robotics uh, summer school and I asked the students whether they knew who he was and they were like, no, never seen. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible he gets getting more and more famous yeah um so he put this into a into a very practical terms right so he said you know there's lots of data on the web i can see my bank statements on the web and my photographs and i can see my appointments in a calendar but can i see my photos in a calendar to see what i was doing when i took them can i see bank statements lines in a calendar no why not? Because we don't have a web of data, because data is controlled by application, by applications, and each application keeps it to itself. So this basic idea of disconnected databases that don't share uh, and don't link information um, among them, right? Uh, you can get, so Tim has lots of interesting talks about this topic uh, on the web. Um, part of your homework before Thursday is to, uh, for you to click them and, and take a look. It's really interesting. Will we, uh, so Andrew asked, will we at all touch on security and data privacy issues in this course? Not really. So I think these are parallel issues. Uh, they are primary concerns of the web community. In the semantic web, there has been work done on security and data privacy, um, but they won't necessarily be part of the topics. I mean, it's, they can pop up in the projects, of course, and in the and in the reading clubs. Uh, but we want to devote uh, theory sessions to them, essentially, because we have no time. All right. So, uh, any more questions? Okay. So, um, so Tim himself proposed this vision of the semant for a semantic web, right? So. You can think of this as a big semantic network that uses all of the content of the web to structure the knowledge of, uh, of the world, right? And he thought of, uh, of a web that would become capable of analyzing all of its data. So the content of the links, um, so that could make our lives easier, right? So a big management system on top of uh, all the knowledge uh, on the web. Um, so this can only happen if, you know, websites publish their information in a machine readable format, right? It doesn't work if people start publishing PDFs on the web or scanned images on the web. Uh, it needs to be machine readable. It needs to be linked, right? So we need to be able to establish links between my Facebook ID and my uh, LinkedIn ID. And, you know, all these things need to match and fit and integrate together. Uh, we need to make enough domain knowledge available to machines to make use of the information. We need to tell the machine what a person is. We need to tell the machine what the properties of a person are and what are the basic properties of basic uh, concepts of the world and the properties of those concepts to make, uh, to make all this work. And of course, we need to make machines able to find and combine published information on the web in that way. 
so that they can use them in their inference engines. So this all boils down to the four linked data principles, right? So you can think of this as in the same way the traditional web works, a web of linked documents, but instead of linking documents, all of them with, with their own uh, UR, unique URL, uh, we link ideas, we link data points, we link uh, bits of information. And each bit of information has, in the first place, a URI, right? So a URI is just a thing that starts with HTTP that represents a thing, uh, whatever that thing might be. Uh, the second point is that we use HTTP URIs, right? Because in that way, everybody can, humans and machines can access them and retrieve content from them just in the same way they use HTTP URLs to retrieve web pages and their contents. Uh, the third rule of linked data is uh, when someone looks up a URI, provide useful information using RDF. So when a machine dereferences a URI of a thing, it should get back uh, information in RDF. We'll jump into RDF uh, on Thursday, describing you know the information it contains, what it represents, whatever. But most importantly, four point uh, that thing. So that information in RDF that uh, is retrieved back must include links to other URIs, right? Related URIs, uh, related things so that machines can discover and can traverse this big graph of information uh, by means of those, uh, of those links. All right, so this is what makes a web of linked data. Uh, you can hear more about that uh, in, this, uh, in this other talk. Uh, but that essentially gives you a web of linked data, right? So this is, uh, as it was a couple of months ago, a big, big uh, uh, collection of linked data sets where every single bit of information in this data set, in this data set is a URI and then all these URIs are all linked together pointing to uh, related entities all across the web. Um, it's very hard to measure, it's very hard to monitor, but we think there are now around 200 billion uh, statements uh, uh, formal logical statements um, describing uh, all sorts of different entities on the web. You can get more about the, this in, the, in that link at the, at the bottom of the page. Um, we at the FU have been doing some experiments on this. Uh, these two cool, cool guys uh, have now a company uh, that... Um, uh, Actually, they'll meet one of them. You'll meet one of them uh, during the course, that's right. Uh, he'll be giving a, an invited talk. And essentially, they're, in a way, they're moved by the Google idea, right? So the crawling all this big uh, linked data space and put it you know, to the service of people that are looking for, uh, for resources in it. Um, another interesting resource is the kind of vocabularies that we need to describe uh, these things, these linked data things, right? So all these bits of... Uh, URI identified pieces of information. Um, and this web is really interesting. So they collect all these vocabularies, all these words, terminologies, ontologies that we use to describe all these different data bits. So um, I'm gonna quickly go through the prospects of big data because uh, this has really been a lot of content for a, for a, first, uh, for a first session. Um, you need to think about all everything we just said about linked data and the semantic web in the context of big data, right? So what is big data? Um, big data is essentially four aspects of data that we learned over the last, I would say, 10 years. Uh, the rule of the four Vs of big data, volume, variety, velocity, and veracity. And all of these, and in particular one of them, variety, have uh, important consequences for the semantic web and KR on the web. Um, but all of them do, really. So when uh, we have large volumes of information, we need to think about uh, KR languages carefully and we can, what we can do with them. Um, 
same for the velocity at which these statements change over time, their variety. So we have different agents asynchronously publishing this information on the web according to different schemas or ontologies, and we need to make those agree and work together. And veracity. So we need to take into account that uh, there might be false information being published on the web, fake news. It's very hard to get uh, um, a, a, a sense of what is true and what is useful. And for that, things like providing provenance of the information um, is really important to, to assess uh, how much we can trust uh, uh, what we find on the web. So Andrew's asking, so variety is much more an issue than veracity, particularly when conflicting truths. Yes, so both are important. There's people doing research on both aspects on the web. Uh, uh, in the course, we'll be touching way more on variety than on veracity. But certainly both aspects are, are important. So recently you might have heard of the prospects. So all these ideas, semantic networks, description logic, semantic web, linked data, and now knowledge graphs uh, have been given different names, but you need to associate all these things together because they are just different versions of, of a very similar idea. Um, so a knowledge graph is, you know, a graph of data, pretty much what uh, we described right now a moment ago with, uh, with linked data. Um, but that encodes knowledge. And then this knowledge bit is important because the fact that you're publishing data on the web as linked data doesn't necessarily mean that you are encoding knowledge, right? You, you're encoding facts. Um, but knowledge is a different thing. Knowledge is, you know, you can operate it, you can, you can do reasoning with, uh, 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 with it, right? So in knowledge graphs, you know, knowledge is represented in a graph-like format, it's machine readable. So it's very similar to linked data, but there's a strong emphasis on, uh, on, on the knowledge part. These are all people using knowledge graphs today for, um, uh, for their business. Another version of everything we just said is FAIR. So now there's a lot of stress on making scientific data fair to make it reusable. And that, makes, uh, that means make it, making it findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. If you click on that link, you'll find the fair uh, principles and the nature article. Um, but this all essentially boils down to, yes, this link data thing, uh, you should all do it. If, uh, if you want to make reusable artifacts in, uh, in science. In a way, it's, it's like a linked data version uh, for, uh, for scientists. Um, suffice to say, this, you know, this, we need to build it together. It's a distributed effort. Um, uh, you're going to do that yourselves in the, in the projects later on in the course. Um, and of course, while you do that, while you build the system, as you'll get dexterity and you know using the technologies uh, of KR on the web on understanding the for its formal semantics but also on you know getting your hands dirty with real world problems like converting existing data sets integrating them integrating their models and ontologies and learning query languages to make use of the information uh, they contain uh, in uh, in web applications um, so here I'm repeating a little bit myself, just to stress the importance that this has for veracity. Uh, there, might, there are people working on using this uh, KR on the web infrastructure for uh, providing additional layers of veracity and trust on top of data that otherwise would be just out in the wild and we wouldn't know whether we can trust or not. Um, but also on variety, because you know the fundamental problem of making linked data on the web and care on the web is that we have information from all different kinds of sources and formats and schemas and uh, assumptions and you know and identities, and we need to conciliate all that. We need to put that into some sort of uh, manageable space where machines can know. Uh, the identity, the identity of all these things, and how to operate in a in a in a very very diverse uh, environment. Um, 
And of course, you know, volume is also a problem. How do you do reasoning in very, very large knowledge bases is also a very hot spot in, uh, in semantic web research. So I told uh, a lot and for very long. So I'm gonna stop here. So this was a really fast forward introduction to uh, to KR and the web, to KR and the web and where, and then the, the interaction of the two.